Right, hello. I'm going to look at my phone here because. Uh, a little tune. This is Louis Armstrong's version. So. Jazzy. This is where the music's from, okay? This is the light switch. Perhaps you need some disco lights or cabaret lights. This is another light. Switch it on. Yeah, well, dressing up, pretending to be someone else, all part of theatre. And uh, welcome to this little talk about an aspect of theatre and a chap called Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht. Brecht. And I'm going to uh, tell you, this light won't go out. Hang on. There you go. Tell you a bit about him. Um, based on some notes I've had for a long time as a drama teacher for many years, um, currently in a, a sort of lockdown that we're we're allowed out a bit more nowadays. But uh, let's uh, have a look at some slides, perhaps. And I'm going to press a button down here that says share screen. I, I'm I'm trying to not make this magic for you. Um, I wouldn't want it to be too much like magic. I want to bear the device of what I'm doing, if you like. So it's uh, it's not hidden in a sort of seamless way of, that you see the joins, if you like. You see, you see that this isn't real, so to speak. It's not a, anyway. This is all you need to know about Bertolt Brecht. Well, not really all you need to know, but it's uh, a few things. And it's not particularly, it's more episodic, I think. It's sort of pieced together in some way. So we start with a wonderful quote here from Brecht. And it, it sort of sums up his approach. He's not trying to present reality like perhaps a soap opera tries to. Here is Coronation Street or EastEnders trying to show you that um, this is the way it is. No, he's going out there with his hammer in his hand and he wants to shape reality. He wants to change the reality in which we find ourselves. Now, here we go. His Brexit is the big one on stage right or, or your left if you like um in the leather coat i just want to put him in a context of three of the great shapers of 20th century european theater and that those three the, the trinity if you like of european theater from a certain angle um for the 20th century and a bit earlier but the biggest effects probably on theatre of these three. Um, Konstantin Stanislavski, stage left top. Antonin Otto, stage left bottom and uh, stage right, Bertolt Brecht. And in terms of their views about reality and, and truth, if you like, let's put them together. What, what's the difference between these three? Well, Stanislavski, if you look at EastEnders and, and Coronation Street, I suppose your nearest person here is Stanislavski. Realism, realistic things. This is what it looks like. And 
apparently there is a rumor I don't know if it's true, if it's him or not, but one of his plays, they brought down a, a tree, a proper tree, and put it in the stage. I mean, he wanted everything to be as exact as possible, as, as realistic as possible. So his truth is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is the truth. Um, you should act in a way that people would recognise as the way that person would act. Now... Bertolt Brecht rejected this. He, he put his stamp on saying, no, that sort of truth is not the truth he's after. He's after a truth which is more of a social truth, if you like. So underneath, there are things going on that make our society not quite as it seems. And we need to sort of raise the consciousness of the audience so that they see things in a different way. And in order to do that, he has to push the audience to the outside and to look at the world in a different way, to see actually what's going on is another truth. There's a, a truth which he took in the end to be based around a Marxist view of truth, if you like. And we'll get into all that in more detail. I'm, I'm going to go into that in more detail. But in order to show that, he wanted to make the world look the world around you look odd, to alienate you from it, to make you look at it from a different viewpoint. Whereas Antonio Nato, there he is. Um, he was different again. There's a, a different level to his work. And he, he with, with the concrete language of the stage and with screams and grunts and movement and, uh, all these things that went on, he would surround the audience with this, this feels, if you like, the feelings, emotions, and surreal imagery and dreamlike states to reach a different truth. Perhaps it's a, an emotional truth or a, a spiritual truth or whatever you want to call it. Um, it. It was very different to the other two. So here we have three different approaches which have, I, I could argue, have still are still resonating to this present day in theatre and and many others. But you could you if you use these three as sort of the beginnings of or a good good a good way of looking at some of the different types of theatre that we see today. Um, Stanislavski, realism, Brecht, expressionism, epic. And Arto, surreal, absurd, emotional, rather than straightforward narrative storytelling or whatever. Anyway, there we go. And it's interesting just looking at them there, the, these pictures. I didn't, the, the, the Arto one is actually in a film there, but my God, what, what intense eyes. This is before he was uh, treated for certain degrees of madness uh, um, and, and given electric electroconvulsive therapy I think 51 times he received that so so he he looked a lot different after that I can I can assure you but but you can see a certain sort of wide-eyed mania in his eyes there would you would you but intense really intense and i think that that's 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 the thing about our toes wonderfully intense stanislavski he's shrewd he knows um his eyes there looking yeah that's the way things are you know solid and then brecht cheeky naughty um got his cool leathers on and his cigar and he's look at him look at that look on his face he's going to undermine everything you're trying to do so there we go. He's against a naturalistic theatre. He, he doesn't like it to look like that. He thinks that people who go to that type of theatre, they go and they hang up their brains with their hats in the cloakroom. Uh, they, they go there to lose themselves, to sit in the dark and to be entertained from afar and to come out but having learnt nothing, it not really changed their minds about anything. They might have felt a few things, 
but their, their, their viewpoint of the world hasn't been threatened or changed perhaps or that's that's his view and you could argue whether that's a fair view or not but that's his view and his thing about thinking was well, because people get the impression that Brecht's plays are rather dull and and they can be done in a very dull way and and i've seen them done very dully but i've also seen them done wonderfully um but thinking for brecht is a great pleasure and it, from this play galileo you know he would a play about a scientist a great scientist and a controversial scientist and you know especially in, in the time that he was alive um but thinking for brecht is what he wants he wants you to go to his plays and think go to the theater and think and it was a theater fit for the scientific age and what, what do we mean by a scientific age well an age of observation of looking at things and trying to find the truth behind them and and for him his his scientific approach is a marxist approach so it's a social science of, of sorts but he wants observation learning this is the way things are look at it from here look at it from here look at it from here right what conclusions can you reach about what we see so the theater fit for the scientific age sums up his entire idea and and that needs of course that we are no longer in some sort of religious age we, we are in a scientific age we are an age which doesn't take things f on surface value we want to dig underneath them and find out what's really going on and that's his idea of science but also that we live in a scientific age in that people were looking for scientific ways to solve the problems of the world and and one of the problems of the world is poverty and and capitalism and, and and this is for brecht okay i'm not saying this is my view this is for brecht and and therefore the scientific age right we're going to move the labora the laboratory i can hardly say that, the laboratory onto the stage and show you the laboratory and who who are we testing up here? Who are we prodding and looking at? Humankind. We're putting them on the stage and we're looking at us, you know, but from an, an objective or a more objective viewpoint. And that's what he's going to try and do is use very te various techniques to move us into, rather than being involved with the everyday emotions of the piece, he wants us to sit outside and look more like a scientist might look at something and this field of writing here is worth looking at Althusser is is a, a, a Marxist philosopher I suppose um, here he is writing about what I've just talked about Now, th th this is interesting. I'll, re I'll read it as well. Breck's principal aim is to produce a critique of the spontaneous ideology in which men live. So the world in which we live, he's trying to critique it. And he's saying, well, th it's, it's natural to you, but I'm going to look at it and we we're going to look at it from a different angle. And one of the ways in which that's done is through the characters the characters don't represent the whole of history or, or the universal being or anything like that except every now and then they'll come down and and take themselves out of character so literally so i'm going to put back on uh, uh, some glasses here so let's say i'm acting um, i don't know who this character is it could be somebody uh, like this and then i'll come down he doesn't know what he's talking about you know and another thing yeah I, i'm i go down there i draw the lessons reflecting on it as one of the spectators we've done our best now it's up to you now he's going to play lots of tricks and i'm going to go through all the tricks he does for this type of thing 
where he's trying to get you to look at it from different angles. So you might get lost in the play for a bit. He said, no, stop, hang on, look at it from this angle. It'll all come clear, don't worry. Now he did have his own critics as well. And I think it's important to look at some of the ways that people might criticize him. And George Lukacs is, is one of the major ones who said, Brecht, you know, yeah, you've got all the right ideas, you're a Marxist, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's, it's another left-wing thinker, Lukacs here. But you don't need to go around alienating all this stuff, all this trickery, all that stuff just show working people on the stage you know in in their life and 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 to see that the way that life is affected their life and you know, and the audience will empathize with these people if you show it in a realistic way show realism you know use realism it's a strong tool for, for revolutionary purposes and they had a big argument brex and lukacs and i think Breck's idea somewhere along the lines, no, 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 you really need the audience to sit outside in order to change things, not just feel sorry for people and all that, but it's, it's well worth looking into the debate. So just because it's Marxist doesn't mean you have to do all this sort of scientific age stuff that Breck bought in his epic theatre. You don't have to do all that if you are someone on the left, but Breck thought you did. And Lukacs, well, no, you don't have to do it like that. And they had a, a big Barney about it, a big argument. So, Brecht's argument against realism, against those things, he, 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 was, he would argue against these things. So, Aristotelian theatre, as, as Brecht looked at it, was a theatre of imitation. It's just pretending to be real life. A theatre of catharsis, you go in all het up for the world and then you come out and you're cleansed and you're feeling better. So you're, you're not going to do much about changing the world at that point. There are universal characters and universal truths and, and Brecht is, well he's undermining that, though, though you could say he has his own universal truth which is a sort of Marxist truth but that, that's by the by in this case. But universality, he's arguing. This is the problem of universality is it's natural, it'll never change. And he thinks the world should change. So he thinks the problem with this type of theatre is its universality. It's, it's, this is the way things are. You can't do anything about it, but let's look at the human condition. Also, this thing about great art that you go there and think, oh, that was superb, what a great play, what a wonderful play. Um, all those things, he, he, he's, he's very suspicious of that and uh, he doesn't want you to go to, oh, what a great, he wants you to laugh and get involved and shout and be, be angered by it, and, but not be overcome by the uniqueness of this great work. You know, it's, it should be on a level, it's, it's more folk art for him, not great art. Um, and, and this appreciation of the perfect imitation of reality. I don't know if you've ever been to a, perhaps a West End theatre play where the, the set changes and it's, it's wonderfully realistic and amazing and, and people go, wow, and they applaud the set. Now he, he would be totally angry at, at that type of thing. You don't want you to applaud the reality of the set. Or, or it looks so realistic, doesn't it? You know, oh, it's so good. Yes, she looked so much like an old woman, you know, the, the makeup was extraordinary. He doesn't want the perfect imitation of reality. Again, he's undermining this whole idea. And here we are, the empathy. I weep when they weep. He doesn't want the spectators. And notice the word spectators, you know, the audience being helpless victims of, of this empathy that they, they can't do anything. They just, oh, it was so, I, I cried, I cried. Did you cry? I cried. And all that going on. He doesn't want that at all. In fact, if you're laughing when they're crying and crying when they're laughing, perhaps that's something he might like. I don't know. But um, he's not saying you shouldn't feel emotions, in other words. But he, he doesn't want you to become a victim of that emotion. He always wants you to be able to step back and look at yourself. Why am I acting like this? Why am I feeling this? And, and those, that step is so important to him. So this is the classic um, 
piece of Brecht's writing where, where he puts dramatic theatre, the sort of Stanislavski and the Aristotelian theatre in one column and epic theatre, his theatre, what he thinks theatre should be like in the other. And it's worth just having a look at that for a sec. So dramatic theatre has its plot. You know, it's, it's the well-made play. It's going to take you through this story structured in a certain way that takes you through various emotions and, and it will reach the denouement and all these things. And it's, it's almost set out beforehand. You know, this is a tragedy, this is a comedy, wherever it happens to be. It's plotted in a way. And, it, and if it's Aristotelian, of course, it goes through the certain unities and, 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 and all these typical things that make the great play whereas his is more storytelling it's a narrative it might not follow a particularly beautiful structure in fact he might undermine it it might go in different directions it might be in episodes we'll, we'll talk about that later dramatic theater well implicates the spectator in a stage situation and in other words there's humanity on the stage i am humanity here here we both are. If I was there, I'd be doing something similar or I wouldn't do that. I, I would um, be more like that character, perhaps that, that character. I don't like that character. I do not, or I really feel for this character at this moment. Whereas Brecht wants you to sit back and look in a puzzled way or a thinking way. And ah, there, yes. Do you see what happened there? Did you? Yeah. All right. So the first one wears down the capacity for action. You come out of the theatre and think, oh, wasn't it lovely? Wasn't it wonderful? Whereas you come out of a piece of Brechtian theatre, as far as he's concerned, you should be, right, let's arm ourselves and put ourselves on the barricades and uh, bring down the system. Whereas the first type of theatre provides you with sensations, feelings, all those sorts of things. The second type, the epic theatre, makes you make decisions. Right, I'm going to do this now. And I'm going to go out there and um, we're going to change the world. Dramatic theatre provides experiences, feelings in that way. Whereas epic theatre pushes you away from being in the midst of experience and gives you a picture of the whole world in front of you. And you're looking at it and aware that you're looking at a picture of the world. It's, it's a snapshot of it. You're looking at it in such a way and you're outside of it. The spectator is involved in something. You're involved in the story. Oh, I found it. I was so involved in that story. I really was. I was really, really involved in it. Whereas now I see the way the system is. Now I can understand it. Suggestion. It it doesn't tell you things. It just seeps out and you, you have to, you feel it and perhaps you discuss it afterwards, but, but it's not telling you stuff. Whereas, whereas epic theater will give you argument. There's this and there's this, and the argument might be on the stage between two or more characters or within one character arguing with herself. Instinctive feelings are preserved. I go in feeling this, I come out feeling this. I feel this, or I might feel slightly different. I mean, Lukacs would argue this, you see, this is the Lukacs point. But instinctive feelings are preserved, and therefore you don't want to change things. Whereas Brecht, you're brought to the point of recognition. So you're going, I go in like this, and then, oh my goodness, Eureka. It's, it's moments where the science suddenly comes clear to you. Ah, that's the way it is. So the spectator in the thick of it sharing the experience, I, I'm involved in it, I, I can't find my way out. It's lovely, it's beautiful, I'm crying, I'm laughing, and all whatever it is. Whereas in Brecht's theater, the epic theater, you stand outside and study. Ah, right, okay, I can, I see that, yeah, okay. The human being is taken for granted. That's the way human humanity is. 
the human being is the object of the inquiry. Look at this. Now, what's going on here? Why is that happening? What's the causal effects of that, that and that? What can we do therefore to change what's happening there? He is unalterable. He, you know, in, in dramatic theatre, you, you don't get that. But in epic theatre, he's alterable. We can change things. She can change, he can change. We can look at this and say, well, if we change this about the system in which we find, the predicament in which we find ourselves, we can alter our behavior and, or we can alter our behavior to change the way things are around us. Eyes on the face, what's going to happen at the end, do you think? And you know, in the second interval, I, do, I wonder how it's going to end. Whereas Brecht theater, well, we don't really worry about what's, uh, the end. In fact, he uses, which Shakespeare used quite a lot, things like at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, where he tells you what the end is. I mean, Brecht might tell you what the end of the play is. He doesn't want you to worry about what's happening at the end. He wants you to look how you got there. It's a bit like um, if you can imagine watching Match of the Day and knowing the result or knowing the result of the football match. If you, if you know the result of the football match and then sit down and watch it, you look at it in a different way. Instead of, wonder, you know, who's going to win and being all tense and all that, you're looking at, ah, right, ah, that's, you know, you see, if he hadn't done that then, oh, he made that mistake, you know. So you look at it in a slightly different way. Um, one scene makes another, so it, it moves seamlessly from one scene to another and you need that scene there and it's seen there and it's seen there for for brecht each scene for itself you i was going to say you could do them in a slightly different order and you could but but that takes away something from from brecht's theater but but there are some plays which are more episodic than others there are some plays which are completely like fear and misery the third reich or something where the scenes could be more easily moved around um, but but certainly this idea that each scene is for itself it's a, it has its own entirety um, and and it's in a montage rather than growthful so this scene this scene this scene this scene creating a sort of montage but they will perhaps juxtapose so he might put one scene next to another scene which slightly undermines what you think you've learned in that scene so he, he plays around with that Linear development, so yeah, we're going to we're moving towards the end here. We're going to go from here to here to here to here. Whereas Brecht, he reckons curves and jumps and all those things instead of evolutionary determinism, which it's like this because it's evolved in this way, the, 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 the play evolves in this way, and that, that's the way it goes. He will jump about and you will say it didn't have to go in that way. He could have done that. That could have happened there and that would have changed that. And all those things would have happened. Now one proviso you, you've got to look at all these things. Brecht said if you want to know my philosophy of theatre, he didn't quite put it in these terms, but if you want to know my philosophy of theatre, don't look at my plays. So in other words, he's given himself a way out. If you look at his plays, they might be slightly different than, than his sort of ideal here. But um, OK, it, it's a cop out. But but some of his plays more are more like this than others. But certainly um, you will notice this is a sort of underlies a lot of his work. Now, I'm not going to talk about um, the, the breadth of his work because his, his work wasn't all the same. He, he did have stages he went through. So we have things like the Lehrstücke, the learning plays. We have his earlier plays, sort of like Baal, which is sort of anarchic uh, and, and sort of more troubadour-esque. Um, but his later plays the 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 great dialectical theater and epic theater of his later years uh, i will sort of concentrate on because that, that's kind of the the brecht that we mean when we look at brecht and right in the center of this is the v effect or the alienation effect or the verfem dunks effect i don't know if i pronounce that brilliantly or defamiliarization so this is central to a lot of what Brecht is wanting to do. I'm just going to go and shut a door over here. Um, and this is sort of bearing the device of theatre, so we can sort of call this a, a sort of V effect as well. So I am defamiliarizing 
you or something. I, I don't know. But the VFX, what, I want to defamiliarize you. So, so when you go to the theatre, I don't want you to feel this is, oh, this is completely okay. I, I know I'm going to sit in the dark here and I'm going to get lost in this world here and all that. What he wants to do is make keep you away, you know, like little shocks. Of, oh, oh, little little ways of making you say, "Well, that's not well." That's yeah, that doesn't. So you're you're constantly looking at it slightly differently. So you're not in familiar territory here. He's he's sort of um, using little effects to make you think. He wants you to think. Don't don't forget that he wants you to think. So he's going to use lots of little effects to make you think um, and a lot of those instead of being lost in a world that looks natural he's going to make it unnatural he's going to alienate the world around you in some ways so Marcuse talks about it in this way So here we go, distance and reflection, not empathy and feeling. That doesn't mean that you can't have feeling and, and I will later on talk about some moments where I think it's extraordinary feeling at moments in, in, in some of Breck's plays and perhaps that's him breaking his own rules. Don't look at my plays to, to understand my theories. Um, but the dissociation Okay, in order to see the world as it truly is, remember this this sort of pursuit of truth with Stanislavski Arto, with Brecht, this is but different truths. Um, but I want you to look at it as it really is. And there's there's you know a, a real world going on here that where workers are exploited by bosses and, and all that. Um so he, he wants to show that somehow. So the world that you see on the stage usually is behind an ideological material veil. Yeah, it's, it's, um, we're not looking at it as though there's anything we can change about the world or is there anything odd about the world. So in order to break that, to make you look at things differently, we really have to stop your identification with what's going on on stage. You don't get lost here. We're going to trip you up to real to know what the real is we have to trip you up to, we have to make the world you thought was real look unreal in order for you to see what really is there so some of the ways some of the ways he'd do this is well here's it i'll start with the acting bit because this is quite interesting so if if i'm doing a stanislavsky play okay right now <laughs> brilliant wasn't it uh now if if we're going to do something about we're going to go into the third person so it's not about i it's about he we're going to put it into the past. It's not now, it was then. And we're going to speak the stage directions out loud. Now that, that's a rehearsal technique. So you don't have to do that in every play, but it, but it gives you the actor, a way of thinking about it. So it, so he wants his actors to go through the process of putting things in other ways. But the, the, Transposition to the third person. So, first of all, he sighed. So there, I've done it. Right? I have presented you with he. I have talked the stage directions out loud. Stage direction, in this case, side, very small one. Um, and it's in the past. So it's not, I sigh, or 
it's all those three things. So by putting it into the past tense is, is crucial. He sighed. <sighs> yeah, I'm presenting you there with my hair going everywhere. I, I'm giving you a third person on the past stage directions, all those things. I'm also addressing the audience as both the actor and the character. Yeah. <sighs> he sighed. Yeah. You, you, no, you're not confused there, are you? Was I one person or am I two people? You're, you're looking at the actor and the character at the same time. He sighed. <sighs> Yeah, well, it's amazing acting. I'm acting as two people. I'm acting as myself, the actor. So th three, three things, perhaps. Three things. There's me, but uh, there's the actor and the character. Yeah. So there you are. he sighed. Yeah, you can see, you can hear me saying he sighed about someone who's, well, this is purging the stage of anything magical. I'm showing you, right. I'm showing you putting on the character. Right. Here's the character. Right. Yeah. Okay, and he's sighing. Oh, no, no, he's not sighing. He sighed. <sighs> now, part of this was the, the, the rather amusing thing of the, the half curtain. Now, if you go to traditional, very traditional theatre now, is hardly anywhere in theatre is traditional theatre, but, but the theatre where the curtain would come down and you would see, um, well, you wouldn't see anything. You would just see the curtain. So at this point, behind the stage curtain, there's magic going on. They're changing the scenery around you. And you, you can hear some clunking going on. So, and then it comes back and it's a different scene. Oh, and, and all those things there. Yeah, he didn't like that at all. So he had what you call a half curtain. So halfway down the stage on a sort of, it's more like a, more like a curtain rail that would go for half the stage, really. And so you could see things being moved behind there and, and stage hands coming on and off and, and, and things like that. He's bearing the device of theatre. In other words, don't get fooled, this is real life. This is theatre. Um, and we're not hiding behind that. So it's quite a quaint now, I think we could call it, because we don't even bother with that now. You don't need that at all. You can just have stage hands coming <laughs> off stage. Anyway. Making visible the sources of light. I've already showed you this here. You can see my roof, my window there into the world there. Where the, this, these are the lights. We don't want to hide them behind anything. We're saying this is theatre. This is the way it looks. Don't get fooled about it being real life. Using signs at the start of scenes. We're saying scene one. Um, in which blah, blah, blah happens or something like that. In which... Mac, Mac Heath gets his comeuppance or something like that. You, you would have some sort of explanation of what's going on, maybe a contradiction or, or, or something there, or, or some learning point that he wants you to get there. But all these things are trying to make it non-real. Not, so it's non-realistic, but it's also making you think, it's also making you sit outside a bit and go, hmm, placards in the middle of shows so i could come in this bloke doesn't know what he's talking about as a placard or something like that or or i could present in such a way um something that's just happened in the scene and and sort of present an alternative view on it etc etc so i couldn't undermine myself or make you think in different ways by placards coming on or contradictory placards <laughs> coming on or, or, or whatever Actors putting their costume and makeup on stage. It's not real. Here we are. So you've seen me sort of transform myself. I will now transform myself in another way. So here I am. And I'm going to put that on. All right. There's that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And now. Yeah. And another thing. You, you see me doing that in some way. I'm not going off stage, changing, coming back and you might think I'm someone else. You actually see me changing. So again, this is Verfremdung's effect, but it's, it's, it's alienating you. But, and it's showing, it's bearing the device of theatre. It's showing the workings of theatre. Actors coming out of character. I've already done that. 
quite a bit already. <laughs> he sighed. Yeah, he sighed. Yeah, uh, yeah he's, a, he's a chancer, though. He's trying to uh, fool you into thinking he's tired. Uh, yeah, songs commenting on the action. So I might um, do something on stage in some way, and then a song, instead of coming out of the characters as they do in musical theatre, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. His characters will come in and, and, and sing, perhaps offering a complete, do you know the, I can't remember, the, where's that gregacious Solomon, you know what came of him, a song which has hardly anything to do with it, the actual action on the stage, and it's not carrying the action forward. It might be offering a completely different viewpoint of something, or it might be um, undermining something that's going on, juxtaposing a different idea. Um, I might be showing you ways into um, the the breadth of that character or putting a Mac the Knife next to... It's difficult to look at Thrupney Opera, actually, because Thrupney Opera is kind of before he gets into his major theatre thing, so I shouldn't really use it uh, as as a, an example. So I, 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 I will take back the Mac the Knife thing. But the songs will comment on the action. Okay, they weren't furthering the action in some way. They'd also frame moments. Now, framed moments are, are really quite spectacular in Brecht. If you think, right, we're going to frame a moment, and he might put a song at the beginning of that moment, a song at the end, he might put a, uh, a character getting changed at the beginning, a character getting changed at the end, a, a change at a placard or something like that. Ways of framing this moment. And if you look at the little episodes, look at Breck's plays in terms of episodes, think of them as framed moments. I think it's Walter Benjamin who came up with this term. I'm not sure if that's right, but I, I think so. Um, you'd frame these moments. This is this bit. Now look at that of itself. Right, let's frame it in some way. Uh, he didn't really mean that. And now it's moved to the next framed moment and next framed moment. So if you look at each of those framed moments, it would have what Brecht would later call a, a gestus, a social gestus. And, and I, I think I'll come to gestus later. But it has it, each framed moment will be telling us something, but it doesn't necessarily smoothly follow into the next one. Acting in quotation marks, I am now acting. Hi, my name is. Right? Oh. This is where I will become the Russian soldier. Yeah, does the Daniel. This Now, I say these things. Now, do you believe, you know? Yes. Now, did you believe I was actually the Russian soldier? Anyone, if you put up your hands now, you lot out there, if you thought I'd become that Russian soldier, um, put up your hands. Now, most of you thought there he is doing a, a rather poor impersonation of a Russian soldier and he's wearing a hat. In other words, you knew it was me dressing up as a Russian soldier. I was acting in quotation marks. I wasn't being it wasn't like where did he go where did that bloke go there's now a russian soldier there how did that happen no i was quoting i wasn't disappearing i was quoting so that's acting in quotation marks now we've already talked about it which i've spelt differently there Arist non -Arist aristotelian than i did last time interestingly enough and that looks wrong to me but anyway this is bearing the device. Aha, did I do it deliberately? Brex referred to his theatre as epic, dialectical, and or non-Aristotelian. Now, the dialectical point is, is, is quite important with this, but if you want to call it though, any of those three things, you can, but there, there generally is, he, he called it epic. So it starts off with this, this rejection of Aristotelian theatre we looked at, then he sort of calls it epic theatre and that, and that columns, those two columns we looked at, but his epic theatre. But his later plays, he stopped really referring to epic theatre and he started to call them dialectical theatre. And, and that, that's kind of a movement amongst some of his works, if you like. We move 
from epic to dialectical and dialectics become his major way in. And this is Raymond Williams, who's a bit of a scholar, who was a bit of a scholar on Brecht, talking about how Marxism affected his work. Right, humankind makes itself. We're not, we're not slaves to nature. We make ourselves and we're in a process all the time. And part of this process is, is argument, is, is, is dialectics. It'd be drawn from Hegel via Marx, you know, this, this idea of thesis, antithesis and all these things um man makes himself humanity makes itself and here we go walter benjamin this is in the terms of epic theater but it's it's the same sort of thing but look it advances by fits and starts like a film strip now there there is this is part of the scientific theories of brex of course is he wants it to be more like film, the theatre. Instead of taking on film and trying to do something completely different, he's taking on, well, film can fast edit and do all these things, and he's quite into all that. But, but read what Walter Benjamin, a, a, a Marxist philosopher, writing about Brecht at the time. This is contemporary to Brecht. These, these are his framed moments. The separation of each situation, creating distance, stopping you being involved in illusion, distances to make you adopt a critical attitude, to make you think. So to show that man is in charge, that we are making our own world around us, that we can therefore change the world around us, this is the way of doing it. Um, we're going to do move and fits, starts, and we're going to uh, take it apart and look at it like a scientist would, you know. Down, oh, what about that? Ah, but look at this. Ah, but look at this. So we're, we're adopting a critical attitude. We're going to think. Walter Benjamin again here. Astonishment rather than empathy. Don't identify with the hero. Instead, be astonished with the circumstances in which the hero has to live. Okay, I'm interested in this relaxed interest and we'll, we'll come to that. So astonished at the circumstances. Of course, astonishment of the circumstances makes you think, ah, so the circumstances are making do that, but we have made those circumstances like they are. Therefore, we can change those circumstances and therefore we should now go out and change them. And one of the ways Breck showed this and he wrote about this is, is it a play, is it? This is, the street scene this is one of his ways of showing actors his method of acting of of, of showing the world in, in a different way and and making you astonished with with things if if, if you like as, as well so if if you look at the, this is part of a theatre fit for the scientific age. If you, if you look at a car accident, here's, here's two people there involved in the car accident. Now, 
part of the astonishment of this is, is of course, how the thing would have happened. But both those people would have different perspectives on it. And then there are other people around who would have witnessed it. And they would have different perspectives depending on their, their own social selves, but also on the angle they looked at it. And perhaps one of them knows one of them, people involved in it, or doesn't like people who drive that type of car, or, or various reasons for, for looking at it in different ways. But a street scene, yeah. Now, part of the street scene, and you look at this guy who's got this big gesture there, he's probably saying, but the way you were driving, you shouldn't be using your mobile phone. You had your mobile phone, I saw you. I saw you with your mobile phone. There, you were sat there with your mobile phone, you weren't paying attention and you went straight into me at the... Now look at all the acting I've done there. I have presented here a mobile phone. You don't believe it's a mobile phone. I have acted as the other driver. So I've acted as one driver and the other driver as well, yeah. I have acted as the car and you drove forward like that. And you know, the car going forward, all these things. So I'm presenting to you lots of different things, in different ways. Now the other actor will act from his perspective in this case and say, look, I wasn't on my mobile phone. I was scratching my ear at that point because of the wasp had gone into it and I was trying to get it out there or something like that. It might be a lie, it might be true. Who are we to know? Um, and I was actually on a green light when I went through and you jumped the red light. And um, that's why I'm ringing the police. Yeah, yeah, he's ringing the police. Yeah. So um, another perspective upon it. So we, we've got all these things going on. And if you present this as, as, as a rehearsal tool, you get into, Breck's acting idea, acting with two faces, three faces, all these different things, perspectives, looking at the circumstances from different angles, juxtaposing things together, undermining things, not saying there's one narrative, uh, sorry, one plot, one story, one hero, and the, obviously the other person's bad, you know, baddie and goody, he's trying to undermine all these things, and he's trying to make you think, well, what actually did happen here? What was wrong with it? What should have happened here? Whose fault was it? And, and those things, and he might actually say, well, you know, if, if they were in um, better cars, better road markings, um, better signage, all these things here, fewer distractions with adverts around or something like that, the, 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 you know, there are wider perspectives than just these two guys here with their accident. Perhaps this accident wouldn't have happened if all these things there. So he wants the audience to look at something that he's using this as a rehearsal technique here for actors to think about how they're going to present to an audience. And it's much like you do when you come back after a day at school or work or wherever you've been and talk to your mum, dad, siblings, or whoever else you live with whoever it happens to be, or a mirror you're looking at, and you're just recreating the, the things of the day. Yeah, and I was playing hopscotch, I was doing this and uh, all that, and then I fell over and hurt my knee and I cried, and that's why I've got a plaster on my knee. There you go, that, that, that's street scene acting, that, that's Brexian acting. You, you didn't think I became that little character there. You saw me and that character at the same time. There we are presenting it, and we're showing a perspective from things and each character is bringing perspectives to it. Um, in the case on the theatre, those cars wouldn't might might be real cars, you know, but <coughs> they might come on stage, but they'd be pushed on. You wouldn't actually, we wouldn't try and recreate the whole scene or we'd have placards with car one, car two or, or whatever it is. We don't want you to get involved in the realism of it. We want you to look underneath what really is happening. So Wiesenschaft, again, I, my German, I, I, I need to talk to my daughter because she's a very good German scholar. I am not, um, so I don't know. But this is kind of a good way of summing up Brecht's, Brecht's plays, the systematic pursuit of knowledge, learning and scholarship. Knowledge, it, this, this thing, it, it's interested in, in learning, in knowledge, in knowing, and, and coming to turn, but this knowing is, is definitely a Marxist knowing, by the way. So, episodes, we, 
get into his episodic narrative structure. And this picture here, I'll come to in a second. So if we frame moments and we put together episodes <coughs> that you're going to look at and see one scene and then another scene and then another scene, then another scene as little framed moments juxtaposed together that you see things slightly differently because the way they're presented to you makes you look at it from a scientific, alienated, objective, that's in quotation marks, objective way. I'm sorry for that. I do apologize for that. Songs or narration will offer alternative views to it. And characterizations and, and all these things. There's a play called The Good Person of Setsuan. And here we see the actor taking on two roles. Now, the actor is taking on two roles, but also the character, Shente and Shuita, the two characters are actually one character. Well, they're not. They're one, they're two personas of one person and the good person of Setsuan. Now, the idea in the good person of Setsuan is that God comes down to now I'll come to that in a second because it's, God wants to find a good person in the world now because it's Brecht you can't have God you can't have God so of course you can't have one hero and all that so he has three gods so the three gods so straight away he's giving us there's no such thing as one truth about this 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 way of seeing there's not one all seeing all knowing god god is and these three gods argue and they don't you know they don't see the world in the same way but they decide amongst them that they want to find a good person so they come down to earth to find a good person and uh, they're rather distressed that it's very difficult to find a good person and um everyone says well go and see Shantae and um, I think it's Shantae is it? it's somewhere and and they go to see her and they they find her and she's losing money and and it's all going wrong in her life and um her shop is she's giving away too many things and she can't function in this way anymore so she invents her brother and she starts saying well my brother won't like me giving away stuff to to you lot so you wait till he comes he won't he won't he won't stomach any of this and then you see this wonderful scene where of course she changes into her brother on stage we don't get fooled by her and she comes in and she is her brother and the brother has to in order to make the shop work she has to be cruel. She has to say to people, no, you are poor, but you can't come and buy things. You know, he, sorry, he has to say these things. You can't come here, can't do that. So in other words, we're looking at this split character. We're seeing, we know it's the same person, but because we're seeing it juxtaposed together, that one of them's a hard character, one of them's soft, the soft character's sort of losing money and the whole thing's going to fall apart. The harder character comes in and makes the shop really work, but the poor don't get fed, etc., etc. So we start to see, well, what's the situation that's making this happen? And of course, we say, well, it's capitalism, isn't it? Because capitalism is, is cruel to the poor. And, but in order for it to be successful, we have to do that. So if we want to change the situation that this poor woman finds herself in, then um, we've got to change capitalism, haven't we? We've got to change the system, brothers and sisters, comrades. So that, that's kind of it. Um, and the gods in the end, well, in the end, they, discover, they say, well, she, this good person isn't quite good, isn't really good because, you know, but that'll do, <laughs> you know, as good as we're going to get. Kind of. It's, it's, a, it's a fun play. One of the, one of the four arguably great Brex plays. 
So, acting with two faces, my kind of gun, they're acting quotation marks, acting with two faces. Um, there we go, there's, there's, well, there's three faces perhaps going on here with this chap here, acting as Arturo Ui. Arturo Ui is a, a Chicagoan gangster, but it's based on, and you might get a little hint of this, because there's the Chicago and gangster with the hat. This is uh, not quite the hat, but there you go. Yeah. Um, but this little moustache here. So it's Adolf Hitler, isn't it? So there, there's, we've got the actor with two faces, three faces, because you see the actor, the Arturo Ui and Hitler being uh, sort of thrown in there as well. The narrating of it, there's the good idea about dialectical theatre might have a narrator. So part of what I would tell you is the story. I want to tell you the story of Arturo Ui. At the beginning of that, there's a whole chorus scene at the beginning of Arturo Ui, um, which, which has narration, tells you what's going to happen, but narration is a great way of coming in and out of character breaking up scenes, making them into framed moments and all that. Other parts of dialectical theatre is breaking the fourth wall. We've got the fourth wall in front of us in, in Stanislavski in theatre. It's there. We can't, oh, it's a quick bit of mime showing you where the fourth wall is. Um, in Stanislavski in theatre, in EastEnders and all that, we don't really break the fourth wall. But in, in Brecht's theatre, look, this is what's going on here, right? This is what's happening. I'm really breaking the fourth wall here. I've broken through it and I'm going to tell you, the audience, what I think. Um, presenting a character, not being a character. So here I am. Yeah, well, yeah, I am Heil Hitler and all this. Heil Hitler, yes, all that. Yeah, I'm not actually being Hitler. I'm sure some of you were fooled by the strength of my acting there. I'm just presenting a character. I'm not being the character. So it's a major difference. When you see EastEnders, the actors are pretending <coughs> to be in character. They, they, they want to be in character. So that's a sort of status left skin. I'm going to be in character. Breck's characters, no, they're not going to be in character. They're just presenting it. Look at this character. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Russian soldier came into the room. Yeah, I came into the room. And sorry, here, here, yeah, yes. I, with my, I brush my beard because I am full of melancholy and, and all that. So acting, in other words, in quotation marks. There you go, I'm quoting the character. I'm not being the character. I'm breaking the false wall. Yeah, I came through and all that. I'm not being, I'm not fooling you in any way. See, Arturo Ui is Al Capone and Hitler and Arturo Ui, and, and just about every gangster movie, James Cagney or, or, or whatever at the time, it's all thrown into one, and, and Brecht's playing with all these different things <coughs> to present the character to you. So it's complex seeing. Yeah, he's trying to show that it's quite complex. There, there, there are different things, different ways of seeing. It's not just one viewpoint. There are lots of things here, and he used montage, to pull those things together to see, well, here's this scene, here's this scene, here's this scene, here's this moment, this moment, this moment, and juxtaposing little things together. And here's a, here's a nasty little trick, but that gives you an idea of how a cameraman does that sort of thing here. Um, the, you know, juxtaposing one thing, so we're giving complex seeing here, I'm making a comment on it. This really is a true image, of course, but you know I'm playing nasty games with it. Um, and I'm making an illusion, and you straight away are using that, and you'll say, ha, 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 yeah, 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 he looks like it, but he could be. And, and so you're thinking about it in some ways, and then you're going to go off on Twitter and now cause a Twitter storm about Nigel Farage, blah, 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 whatever he's playing at now, that he's a Nazi or something, even though um, there he is in his pinstripe suit there, you know, and I could say, well, that's Chicago and gangstery sort of thing well i don't know but i'm going to play with little things to create juxtapositions to make you see things i'm saying it's complex i mean it's quite a simple one that you know and and it's one that's been done to death by by many people which but but you can see what i'm playing out there and, and this is kind of if you the play arturo Ui, 
by Brecht is kind of a pantomime on, on Hitler. Um, and it, it does those type of things anyway. Um, the complex scene. <clears throat> so the, the important thing here is, is, is what it rejects, if you like. So Wagner is, is sort of a great sort of 19th century artist, you know, that, that created great pieces of work, um, which synthesized all the art forms. His, his great dream was to bring together music, drama, myth, beautiful scenery and, and you know, hugely mythological, but, but to give you this huge, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, Phil Spector's wall of sound all around you to make you emote, to get you lost in it, to, to make you feel, to make you weep, to make you, but it's all about the, the emotional sort of turmoil around you and right into the Germanic idea of history or, or you know, and the mythology, the ring cycle, all that sort of stuff. Now Brecht, who worked with Kurt Weill, who wrote some music for him, especially in the earlier works, um, they wanted to separate out the, the workings of the theatre. So of course, this this thing about seeing, bearing the device, seeing everything as separate and, and seeing it work against each other and, and look at it in complex ways. And we want you to see from this angle, this character, this character, this character, this way of seeing, this way of working, this way of thinking. Um, so all these things become a complex way of looking at it and every element, so whether it be scenery, music, um, songs, costume, actors, set, props, make up all these separate elements and each actor and each character <laughs> and each scene is part of that was juxtaposed with others and they undermine, they comment, they contradict, they, they make this huge complex idea going on around you. So you can see the contradictions that we all have to face because of the world in which we live, of course. So instead of this sort of united pulling together that Wagner wanted to do, Brecht and Weil, you know, are just sort of smashing it all down into little bits and as, as you would do as a scientist instead of being overcome and overawed by it all the scientist goes no let's look at how it works i want to get underneath it i want to get underneath it all ah this doesn't work with that and this doesn't work with that therefore this and the actor scene in in arturo is one of the the, the great Breck scenes. I, I, the play's not great, I don't think, but the, this scene is, is one, of, one of the best. Ooh, I'm not going to be a thorough. I put this hat on and I put it on backwards, so it's not that way. Or it should be, no, I'll put it on this way, but I look like an Englishman abroad, right? So do I look more like a gangster? I don't think I do, really. Let's put the glasses on as well. What's that mean, unnatural? No human being behaves natural these days. When I walk into that meeting tomorrow, I don't want to look natural. I want them to notice that I am walking in. Yeah, so a nice summation there of the politician. So what happens in this scene is we see through an actor, a darling who's rather alcoholic and comes in and, and trains, and trains Arturo Ui to be, to be acting natural he doesn't want them he wants him to be natural in the thing but then oh he's going no, i don't want to be natural i want to be unnatural you know <laughs> i want to be that the thing you don't want me to be i want to be i want him to notice me and and by the end of this scene he's cr created this extraordinary character that you might recognize you know with a one thing, right? He becomes Hitler in front of our eyes. So from this sort of strange, um, downbeat gangster in the cauliflower trade, you know, this downbeat gangster, he becomes this strange, jumped up little Hitler, literally. Um, and uh, it's a very funny scene, but it, it's, it shows putting the character on it's a great one for a for a performer to take on this scene to to act 
the actor's craft, if you like, in a very Brechtian sense. We see the character emerge of the of the character we all recognise as Hitler, and and the it becomes summed up there that Hitler's putting it on. So so like like politicians do. So you know how does a politician change over time? So this is the other thing that you might do if you're doing complex seeing. You might want um, moments in that scene of, of noticing other politicians about how they put on things and, and you might sort of play around with montage, you might play around with that. So for example, again, this is not great subtlety or anything like that at all. Here we have a politician in his youth, you know, and of course he would have been trained and, and, and became things as time goes by. So, so there we have um, slightly less <laughs> Less useful as the first one, but we see him changing through time. So you you might get your actor to suddenly become Blair in the middle of this or something like that, um, or yeah, post Iraq Blair. Um, you can't see that's Farage. I think he's stuck behind me there. Thatcher went through a lot of training. I, her voice was shriller when she was younger, and then she went through training and got it very dark. Yes, we are becoming a grandmother. Um, and and this this sort of um, change in her voice was trained about her. Harold Wilson smoked a cigar, but put him in front of the ordinary voter. If he smokes a cigar, then that sort of gives us an impression of somebody else. So he wanted to be man of the people. So he thought a, a, a pipe would be better, but on his own or with friends, He'd be smoking a cigar. Um, v for victory, the cigar there. Of course, I suppose one of the things Harold was reacting against was this sort of Churchillian cigar smoker. Um, I mean, Gaddafi. I mean, you know, wonderful. <laughs> He's dressed up there beautifully. <laughs> um, what can I say? So, um, Every time you do it, you know, the, the Brecht is also sort of saying, but the, but the acts of you're making decisions. Everything you do, everything you say is, is a decision and you could have made other decisions. All right, so we're testing you. The character is tested here. Why is that character doing that? <clears throat> could have done other things. The technical term for this is fixing the not but. So, I think he described this as a character. So in, in the Stanislavskian theatre, <clears throat> we see a character going down a corridor and going into a room. So corridor, open door, room. Now, a Brechtian actor has to look at that corridor, look at all the potential doors, show that they're not <clears throat> going through those doors, but they are going through this door. Right, I'm not going to go there. So, <clears throat> ah, to show you could have done other things. I could have done this, but I did this. In, in the life of Galileo, we see the new Pope in his underwear. He debates the use of torture threats to force Galileo to renounce his Copernican ideas and the Pope dons layers of vestments. Now, again, this is a bit like the actor scene in Uwe that we see someone transforming before our eyes. Here is the actor playing the Pope, playing the Pope with his gear on. So there's, there's the Popish, character without his clothes on and he's just sort of ordinary man if you like bung all this stuff on and the power comes and with the power he assents to the threat of torture yes we can now torture Galileo so in other words oh, I don't know I don't know I don't know bung this on bung this on Doomf. all right now I kill you yes I torture him you see, you thought I'd become the Pope then, didn't you? But no, I was playing him in quotation marks. So, torture him. 
the not but. We see the Pope as man showing what he could do. I could do this, I'm, I don't know what to do. I, I should we torture him, should we not? But as a man is not going to do, I, I can't make it, but yeah. You know, yes, we must torture him. I love this, it was as bad as my Russian accent. It's probably worse than my Russian accent. He's a my Italian. He's going to torture him, but only when he gets to the point of wearing all the gear. So we say, right, power corrupts, you know, or should man have that much power? Um, in whose interest is that power being exercised? All these things, so, so Brecht all the way. There's another picture of Brecht. Um, the coherent, this is, I mean, this is beautifully contradictory in itself. The coherence of character is in fact shown by the ways in which its individual qualities contradict one another. So the, the contradictions of character, yeah, the contradictions here, that gives us the coherent character. <laughs> and the contradictions around us are forced upon us by the way the world is. We have to do this. We have, I have to dress up as a man in order to make my shop work. You know, all those things. I have to dress up as this. I have to dress up as that. We have to, we can't live sort of completely honest and noble lives because the world around us is forcing us into horrible decisions that we have to make and these decisions we have to make to survive you know I, I i might feel sorry for the beggar and i give this beggar 10 pounds oh there's another beggar five pounds another beggar one pound another beggar i haven't got another beggar yeah another beggar. get out of my way yeah <laughs> with all these things around us sort of conspire to make us act in different ways where of course you know if if Brecht had his way, that, that society would be perfect and therefore man could be perfect. That, that's kind of it. But that's where I think things fall apart. And and there's interesting sort of insights into Brecht living in East Germany after the war, where he starts to look at the communist regime around him and, and start to think, well, perhaps this isn't great. But then he died. So we don't know quite where that would have gone. Um, here's, here's a great character, because I go back to this, the individual qualities contradict each other and, and all that, but, but this can be beautifully done. And this is why I, I don't think Brecht is, a, is, is alien to emotion, really. This is an extraordinary moment that usually brings me to tears in, in Mother Courage. We have this character, well, Mother Courage has sons and a daughter, and the daughter, Catherine, is mute, can't, can't speak at all. Um, and so gestures and, and various other things. Now, there's a point in the play, and I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing with you here, but, but the, the village where um, Catherine has, has some sort of loyalty to it, for various reasons, the the army from the enemy, and and what the enemy is, and all that is is up for grabs in Mother Courage. And again, when, if you know the the script, the, the things change around her. <laughs> of course, things change around her, and she has to work her own way within it. But forgetting all that, Catherine is wants it's it's at night and she wants to warn the villagers that the army are coming to kill rape pillage whatever they're going to do the the enemy is coming but the enemy is with her as well you see so but she goes up into a tree and bangs a drum bang 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 bang, bang in order to wake up the villagers bang 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 so she is the mute and she's making the greatest noise there's there's the contradiction she can't communicate, and yet she is communicating here in, in such a powerful way as to wake up the villagers so they know something's going wrong. But, and this is the not buts that comes with that. She goes up there and bangs a drum and all this, but then one of the enemy soldiers says, if you don't stop, we're going to shoot you. 
kill you, whatever. And instead of carrying on, she has to show, I am not going to do this, but I am going to do this. So she has to show the decision here. So she stops drumming. And she looks, looks to the, probably as the actor here, you would look to the gun or, or whatever's going to, whatever the director has got here to kill you with. Looks to the gun, looks to the village or where we pretend the village is or village this way or whatever, looks there uh, and probably looks at us like, what would you do? And might come out of character there. Yeah, what is she going to do? We come back in. And so all that, and then she drums even louder and more enthusiastic than before and is <laughs> shot dead. And at such a beautiful, I know it's tragic, such a beautiful moment. And, and it's sort of got so many of Breck's things in something that's quite simple there. So it's an emotional scene, it resonates. We see her choice. And even if we feel we have no choice, we can still fight for change. She still had no choice. You might say, but she had no choice. She was going to die. So she should, but that, in, the, in that sort of theatre, she would have not done it. In Breck's theatre, of course she's going to do it. She's going to sh say, even in this most desperate of moments, I have a choice and I'm going to do the right thing. And the most eloquent moment of the play, well, one of the most eloquent moments of the play is done by the mute, the mutest of characters. So even if you are, can't make a noise, you can make a noise, you know, all those things. Another one <clears throat> is the oxymoronic idea. Breck, Breck loved oxymoronic formulations. He would put things together in, in sentences, you know, to, to make obvious contradictions in the sentence. So, but, but even his ex explanation of this moment <clears throat> is the silent scream. So how can you have a scream that's silent? Well, you can't, can you? <clears throat> but the oxymoronic idea of it is, is, is pure Brecht. And here we see the actress here screaming. And, and again, it's, an, a wonder, it's, it's Mother Courage again. That's, that's Mother Courage herself. It's a wonderfully evocative, emotional moment um, that's immediately taken away from us and, and then put in quotation marks, etc., etc., whatever you want to do with it. But um, Mother Courage hears news that her son has been killed. This is an extraordinary moment in the play. Um, but if she admits that she's the mother of the person who's been killed, she too will be shot. And she's a survivor. This is the thing. Mother Courage is going to survive no matter what happens around her. Her She's going, to, I'm going to keep going, keep going, keep going. And this is her flaw, by the way. This is in, in sort of dramatic theatre. This is, this is courage. This is great. You know? but, but Breck's undermining courage here. So there's another oxymoronic idea. So, so the mother and the courage are sort of in sort of, a, sort of an oxymoronic relationship, perhaps. Uh, and, we, and we can talk about that till the cows come home as well. But but the silent scream here. So in, if she screams at that moment, then the soldiers would think, ah, you're the mother. No one would scream like that unless they were the mother and she would get shot and, and other people might die as well. But the fact she screams, therefore, she has to do it silently. And we have the silent screams. So. And so, the soldiers don't hear and they don't think and therefore they don't make the connection. So in the end, she's denying her parenthood. She, the, the whole system of her with her cart, having to sell stuff from it to anyone who's, her enemies become her friends and she, she changes the flags that, on that she flies depending on who's in charge of the land she's in at that particular moment. She ends up with all her kids dead. She ends up not being a mother anymore. 
but still courageous. <laughs> but the courage that she shows undermines her motherhood. All, all these things. I mean, extraordinary play. And again, one of the four greats. So the lessons of mother courage, the bourgeois learn nothing, her children are dead, she carries on alone. And the question that Brecht then leaves for you as she sort of wanders around with her cart at the end on her own, is, is she courageous? And, and, and in a dialectical sense, he's showing these arguments on stage and he's not gonna reach the conclusion himself. This is, this is for you to discuss audience, is she courageous? right but no the system's done this 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 was that blah 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 blah. what choice did she have and what they said but yeah but her way of reacting to it all the way through was to do the right thing that we think in our society the bourgeois think but actually the right thing is the wrong thing here <laughs> you know she should know and, and what could she have done at different points throughout the play well she courageous so dialectical theatre, epic theatre, is does it leaves the audience having to make up its own mind to see things for itself, to to argue together, and uh, not to just come out of the theatre and say that was good, wasn't it? And have a, a glass of wine. You should be out there drinking beer, smoking a few fags, and arguing, and then going out and changing the world. That's the idea. There she is in the. I think it's Helen Beagle, I, I can't remember. Um, well, there you go. It's a, it's a wonderful last image. <clears throat> Another one of his great plays, Caucasian Chalk Circle. I think it's probably my favorite play here. Instead of the judge being a rogue, the rogue shall be the judge. What happens if an ordinary person gets to be judge? And it's, I think it's a Solomon again, is it? The, the, the chalk circle. I'll, I'll come to that because I well, no, was doing that. Um, you draw the circle on the ground, you can see there. And we have the mother. Biological mother of the child who has abandoned the child at time of there was a revolution and she just ran away and left the child behind. She's very rich, very bourgeois and all this sort of stuff. And the servant girl, Grusha, um, sort of leaves the house as well because she, you know, scared in revolution, doesn't know what's going to happen and she was servant to the bourgeois. Um, so, you know, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the rich person. So she, she's on the run and then she hears a cry and, oh my God, and she's left the baby behind. So she takes the baby and brings the baby up as her own. Now, beautiful Brexian thing. Who, <laughs> whose land is it? Whose child is it? Who, who should own what, you know, and this, this kind of thing. And Asdak, when he becomes um, the judge later on, has to solve this thing because there's this conflict between the two. There's, don't forget, there's the true biological mother. And then there's the mother who's actually brought the kid up. Um, and Aslak says, right, you've got to pull the child between you. And the person who pulls the child out is the true mother. This is sort of thing there. Okay. And so they get in the circle here. And they, I think it happens three times. And once they oh, pull, 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 and the child's crying. And Grusha gives up. Oh, no, you take, um, do it again. Do it. Uh, and you can put, you play it as many times as you want. Um, but Azdak sees basically that Grusha gives up and doesn't. Do it. So here we are, waiting for this moment where he says, Right, the true mother is the rich person. but no, he says, right, then here we have my judgment that the true mother is Grusha. Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? You said you could pull them out. Well, no, it has to be the person who wanted less harm for the child. But 
There we go. And he's on the side of the poor. And all his judgments are on the side of the poor. And, and he had, does lots of judgments, uh, always on the side of the poor. And this is, of course, again, sort of playing with things that, that uh, uh, you may see. Well, he's, he's, he's always on the side of his own class and all that sort of thing. Uh, so like judges now are always on the side of the rich. Uh, so that's what it's about. Okay. Now, the part of the, ah, uh, okay. Brett was a lovely smoker. He, he really enjoyed it. It killed him in the end, by the way. It's not good for you. Uh, it gives you heart attacks and things like that. But, but he liked the idea of a smoker's theatre. Now, I want you to think, I haven't got, have I got a cigarette? I don't smoke, so I haven't got a cigarette. But perhaps something can be cigarette. Um, yeah, I'll go and get something over here. This is bearing the device, of course. I haven't prepared this. Um, so here we go. So instead of there, yeah, it's a pen. So if you put a pen in your mouth, it's still a pen in the mouth. But pretend this is a cigar or a cigarette. Cigarette for the poor. He likes his cigars, though, a bit bourgeois. Not not very Harold Wilson. And you know, I don't think you ever see smokers nowadays. They're not. They're, it's hardly any of them now, actually, in, in this country, certainly. But, and at the moment, you don't see many. But uh, when you do, they're outside of offices and things like that, all huddled, you know. It was always as a teacher, we had a smoking staff room, and that would be the most cynical room, you know, where the cynics would be. And they would smoke and point out why senior management were a load of shit and, and talk to each other about that. Yeah, and another thing, you know what it is. But this is what Brett liked. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing. This sort of contemplative sort of Yeah. And I'll tell you what. <coughs> yeah. Smoker's theatre. So he liked the idea of a smoker's theatre. It makes you observe things from you know. Mm -hmm. And another sort of way he looked at it was the sporting arena. Yeah. A bit like I gave the match of the day example earlier, but if you go to a sporting event, yes, you're caught up in the emotion of it and all those things there. Yeah, and I, I can promise you, you are huge. If, you, if you're not a, a tender of football, then you should be. But again, not these days. You're not allowed to actually have audiences, are you? Crowds, as they're called in the parlance. But educated participants in the event you can see the whole thing you know so what's better than watching on tv you're looking at the whole thing and you'll be looking at that person there and you'll say look what he's done there and all that he should have done he should have and the bloke next to you is going yeah but he should have done that and the woman next to you is going yeah but he should have done that yeah but yeah and you're having this right yeah i didn't think he'd play bro he's playing rubbish game off and referee referee's a wanker and all those things that, that go on you know you're having these different discussions from different angles and of course depending on which team you support but it, but usually even though you're all on the same side at this side of the arena you're you have differing views on who's doing well and who's under manager and all this stuff so you're you're discussing things about what could be done better what who's at fault why that's not working all that sort of thing so so Breck's idea that's what he wants in his audience a sort of smoking looking uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that conducive to observing and thinking and and the same as the 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 sporting audience you know i was thinking oh yeah yeah no look at he's kind of oh he's, he's screwed take him off and all that that's that sort of observing criticizing thinking talking about how it could be done better how it could be changed all that sort of thing it's so it's the smokers the public the spectators are all together here looking at things in an observing way the same as they do in a sporting arena and this is Rancière yep all right remember when 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 what's his name was playing so so me as a Spurs supporter it's a do you remember when Hoddle was playing or, or yeah, no, Gaza would have sorted that free kick. He would have done that brilliantly. You know, bloody hell, why can't we do free kicks these days? I'm sure they must practice them. 
yeah or, or don't let him take the penalty oh no yeah or he can't he never gets past the first man with his corners unlike Ginola I mean yeah anyway um you're looking at things in that emancipated way <laughs> you're, you're free to think you observe you compare things you interpret things you connecting things um thinking back you're, you're doing all this so, so so that's what's going on with the spectator in in brechtian theater because you've got these gaps you know you're, you're you're putting frame moments there perhaps between each frame moment like a boxing match you can walk around which Mahagoni, which I talked about earlier, was take takes place in a boxing ring at, at points. But, but that's that's by the by. You can you can um, talk about it at those moments. Yeah, I would have done that. What's that song about? <sighs> yeah, well, or whatever. Now each framed moment can have its gestus, its social gestus. Um, and I talked about this earlier. I said I'll talk about it later. Well, well, here we are. Um, the most uh, easy form i've seen of social guesters way, way of expressing social guesters is there's um mr puntilla and his man matty which is a play by brecht one of when it's it's not performed so often um but in that the the production i saw um his man matty who's his servant chauffeur and all those things um picks up it, you know, there's a point where where Puntilla has to move between somewhere and somewhere, and so Mr. Puntilla is is hauled up onto the back of his man Matty, so given a piggyback by his man Matty, and there you go. That, that's that's Augustus, if you like, there's a small snippet, and he goes across the stage like that. So there we go. The servant is literally carrying the master. Um, it's it's an obvious one, but it's this social behaviour, yeah, that goes on in that scene. Now Brecht talks about how you should know what's going on if there was a glass wall and you couldn't hear anything. So just because you couldn't hear it, so theatre for the deaf, if you like, if you can't hear it, then you should still know what's going on. So you can still see the social relationships that are going on on stage. And, and you'll understand it all by there it is, there it is. Pretty obvious what's happening. And this is a bit like um, something which he brought from Chaplin. And, and this is Brecht talking about Chaplin. That in a scene where, I think I've got a picture of it, there it is, there's Chaplin eating a boot. Um, what what um, Brecht bought for that? is because because what Chaplin does there is use proper table manners he, he, he plays the bourgeois and it's the juxtaposition of the bourgeois manners and yet he's eating a boot you know that showing the absurdity of the manners if you like um considering the situation he's in and and it's so there you know what brex would call spass humor funny fun um you can make people laugh as well in absurd moments of course it's it's a great moment so as that in in um Caucasian chalk circle talks to Shava. This is earlier before he becomes the judge, but here he is describing a scene which um, about why you you shouldn't eat like that. So he's got in front of him a, a rich man the prince i think and he's saying look you shouldn't eat like that if you eat like that you're going to get killed by the revolutionaries they're going to know that you are eating like a rich man so here we go we're going to change your gesture yeah to make it socially fit and and, and this is this should be done in such a way that you'd be eating in a bourgeois way like chaplin with a boot <laughs> but now we're going to make you eat in a poor man's way so 
So Azdak teaches him how to eat, how to change his gestures in this scene. So this becomes a social guest, a beautiful moment of how the poor eat. So Azdak talking here. You surprised I didn't hand you over? It goes against the grain. Finish your cheese, but eat it like a poor man, or else they'll still catch you. Do I even have to tell you how a poor man behaves? The box is the table. Put your elbows on the table, and now surround the plate with your arms, as though you expected the cheese to be snatched from you at any moment. Now hold the knife as if it were a small sickle. And don't look so greedily at your cheese. Look at it mournfully, because it's already disappearing. And now we have the social gestus of, the, of a poor man eating, and, and the rich man does it under instruction. So we have the third person going on there. We have the explanation of how you're going to act it. Because he's acting it. He's acting poor. Um, in order to save his life in, in this case. And, and Aztec showing perhaps he's a good person, even though later on you, you, you wonder, because with all Brex characters who are, you think are good, they, they're going to be undermined at some point. And so I mentioned Spass fun earlier. Um, his last message to his, his theatre group, the Berliner Ensemble, before they took their tour to London, was communicate the fun of making theater that can change the world. It's got to be fun, you know? So we're gonna change the world, but we're gonna have fun doing it. And Spass is, is a very important part of that. And there's him looking slightly as though he's having fun there, but he's smoking a cigar and in the end, he, he dies of a heart attack. Um, and, and in, he's buried in a coffin, but he, part of his will is that he's buried with a, uh, a stiletto, not a sickle, a stiletto through his heart, yeah? Because he was paranoid about waking up in a coffin, you know, but anyway. Brecht's a highly interesting individual, but he worked as part of an ensemble all the time. There, there are huge arguments about his roles, um, um, in his plays, he, he, whether he wrote them or not, um, there, there is huge evidence that a lot of them were written by other people. In the main, female partners of his, who he was sexually promiscuous, some a number of them committed suicide and, and various other things. I mean, it, it's, it's clear to undermine him in the end, as all, all you should do with all your heroes, is to say that he was not the nicest of people, but then who is? Um, but overall, his work under the title of Brecht is very interesting, um, has had an extraordinary effect on theatre in, in the Western world, um, including going to England at that time, the Berliner Ensemble. So although Brecht wasn't with them, um, they made a, had made a great impression on this woman, Joan Littlewood, who was impresario, I called her, or director, impresario of the, the Theatre Royal Stratford East. And she, with, with her partner, Jerry Raffles, had, had built this theatre up and, and were doing wonderful things in there. There she is with the Theatre Royal. It's changed now, my goodness, it's changed now. But there, there's Stratford at the time. There's Barbara Windsor, who, who early on, before she became Bar Babs, um, acted with Joan Littlewood. Um, oh, What a Lovely War is, is a very good example of theatre which is influenced by Brecht. Um, to me, Brechtian theatre has to be political. It has to have um, a message in it which is from the left, generally. Um, and of course, Lions Led by Donkeys, written by a right winger, original book, I think, written by Alan Clark. But taking um, that view and, and, and turning it into the musical, Oh, What a Lovely War, was 
quite a major hit for um, Joan Littlewood's Theatre Royal Stratford. He said it transferred to the West End and the bourgeoisie loved it, of course. But Pierrot's clowns slowly getting dressed as soldiers as, as you get through it. You, you, all the juxtapositions, the playing with imagery, all, all those sorts of things uh, have come to mind as, as, uh, as you watch um, the, the, the wonderful production. And, and it's, it, there's a film of it, which isn't so great as, as seeing it in the theatre. Of course, never. Uh, certainly for this type of theatre, which which has to be experienced at you know the end of the pier or cabaret lights and all this sort of stuff coming to the fore, um, the songs of the, the folk music of the time and uh, and all that, but um, with with the audience around you talking about it and, and making decisions about what could have avoided this, you know, but uh, it's it's a great example of of the type of Brechtian theatre and how it went on to influence theatre beyond that. And I think uh, another example is Pina Bausch's work, which I think is quite extraordinary. It's a dance, ostensibly dance, but it's dance theatre, if you like, and, and takes the the episodic nature, the the dressing up as characters to, to a further extreme. And I think there's a lot of perhaps earlier Brecht within it, um, but but to a further extreme, I mean, it, it 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 plays with a lot of things that Brecht plays with, with montage, with episodes, with with gesture, with um, breaking the fourth wall, with with coming in and out of character, all, all those sorts of things. And well, beyond that, I mean, some some of the physical theatre of, of Theatre de Complicité. Um, they did some Brecht work that, that there's them doing Caucasian chalk circle there. Um, and there's there's other other scenes that they, they, they bring in and how they use projections, which is another Brecht thing, which I didn't mention, by the way, but he used projections um, and, and placards and all these things. So I think there's there's a way that we get to quite contemporary theatre and beyond this. But what I must emphasise as far as I'm concerned, which is most important, is you don't look at theatre that uses a few placards, projections, breaks the fourth wall and call it Brechtian. It isn't. Brechtian theatre has to have political, has to have a political ideology behind it. It, 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 it. it has to have its political message because it's alienating. It's using theatre to make you look at things in a, in a specific way. I have to stop there. I'm coming to the end of this now, so I know where I am. <laughs> um, and it's almost at the end anyway, which is, which is wonderful. So, so Brexian theatre is a political theatre. It has to be political. It has to be seen as 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 a labor laboratory on stage that the audience is made to look at things afresh and and these are not just a collection of techniques because if you just throw a collection of techniques together you're probably making bullshit theater if you want good theater it's it's got to have those techniques with a purpose there must be some reason behind it and if you don't know what that reason is then you're then you're creating bad theatre and it's deadly theatre as Peter Brook would call it or, or whatever please don't use those techniques for no reason use them with the reason that Brecht might do and though my politics might not be the same as Brecht I think he's a wonderful interesting character but but forgetting that because he's got some despicable parts to him his body of work is is extraordinary and and if you particularly galileo mother courage caucasian chalk circle and the good person of sets one and and those four plays on their own are, are quite special and for me caucasian chalk circle is is maybe galileo but caucasian chalk circle is the epitome of what good Brecht is all about and uh hope it's been interesting for you
thank you for coming thank you for watching and now i'm going to bear the device of switching it all off somehow and where do i go with this i can't remember i've got to get that out of the way and uh let's uh stop somehow and uh yeah thank you <laughs>